historically, this was a salmon port. My dad and uncle grew up here locally in town, and my grandfather was a, a logger. At that time, you had two choices. After you left school, you could either go to work in a logging industry, timber industry, or you went fishing. They started with a small boat when they were in school. Their earnings off of that boat, while they were still in school, they were able to buy a little bit bigger boat in the 30-foot class and uh, go a little bit further salmon fishing. From the earnings from that, they were able to build their first boat. They built this shop at that time in the middle 1940s. They built their first boat right here in 1949. The licensing and the restrictions and everything weren't in place then because there was more abundance of fish and everything. It was different times. I'd say it was the, probably the heyday. By the early 70s, things started to cool down a little bit. And then they sort of retired, and so I moved in and, I mean, took over the business. Mostly it's been a lot of boat repair, rebuild. There hasn't been a new wooden commercial fishing boat built probably since the 80s. I'm working on boats from that era on down to this boat is in 1927. There's not a lot of those early boats left. The people that are still in the industry and still using the boat as a tool, those boats are being maintained. The marginal fishermen that one bad year can knock them out of business and their equipment isn't safe to fish year-round, those boats are uh, being chopped up and put into dumpsters. The biggest pressure on fishermen right now is economic, um, and it's coming in part from very, very cheap imports, a lot of it coming from Asia, farm shrimp, farm tilapia, farm pangasius catfish. Those all put a really low seller on the price of fish, and to some degree, if you're going to compete in that kind of commodities market, um, you're always going to have that really low point pressure um, coming from these farmed seafoods coming from Asia. Um, the other economic pressure is the development of the coast itself. As uh, California has gentrified, the coast in a way is much more valuable as a vacation at home spot, it's a second home spot. Um, marinas um, uh, are under a lot of pressure to serve as hosts to sailboats and yachts rather than trawlers and longliners. So on the one hand you've got low prices uh, for fish, on the other hand you have escalating dockside real estate values. Also, fuel is going up. So they're in a little bit of a pinch. The fishing community is definitely changing. There seems to be a generation of fishermen that are getting older and going away. And the younger fishermen that are replacing them they have different goals, they have different business models. One thing that's really difficult about fishing out of San Francisco is that the wharf itself is turning into a Disneyland. It's really frustrating. I mean, we just lost our chandlery. You know, when that business recently changed ownership, now there's a bunch of t-shirts and um, saltwater taffy. We need things like chandlery, we need an operating fuel dock, and we need an ice dock. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of investment in the things that really keep a port a working port. Being a fisherman is anything but an easy lifestyle. Uh, it's very feast or famine, right? One year you're, you're doing great, the second year you're struggling to, uh, to make your boat payment or the payment for your licensing fees. It's not an inexpensive proposition uh, and you need to have a good season in order to, uh, to be making money. There are not a lot of young people getting into the industry, and it has cost a lot of money. I mean, that's alarming to the whole industry, even to the, to the councils that manage the fish. In addition, you're risking life and limb out there. Uh, sometimes the seas get choppy, you're out there for days at a time. Um, 
and then you're coming back in into pier here uh, and you're hoping that you're getting a good price. You're not setting the price, you're being told what the price is based on this global market. It's always a big challenge to make everything come out right in the end and have enough money to pay all your bills and, you know, take care of your family and stuff. If you're just reliant on, say, salmon fishing or crab fishing or, you know, just a couple fisheries, if there's some problem with them, you know, because it's all based on environment and marketing and regulations and all this type of stuff, you're in big trouble if you're just reliant on, you know, a couple things. My father was a fisherman until I was 11 or 12 years old. They called me and my two cousins that lived next door the wharf rats for a long time down here because we were always down here. We had our rowboats and we fished for herring and sold it to the fishermen for bait. As soon as I could, I got a job on a fishing boat. I think I was 16 years old, got a job in one of the local trollers and, and then I leased a skiff the next year. and and uh, 1963, bought my own trover. I've been doing this for 50 some years. I, uh, I had a 12 year career as a, as a teacher in the local school, school system. And after 12 years, I was kind of burned out on that and making more money in the summer months fishing anyway. So we got out of teaching in 1978 and went full time fishing. In my entire life, I've only been away from the ocean for six months. I was born and raised in Florida, and I was on the water constantly. I was working um, in the oil field in Louisiana, and I came home to California for just a vacation. And the place I went to school, I went there just to kind of visit them, and they've got a bulletin board. And on the bulletin board, it was asking for sea urchin divers. And I was gonna be here for a month, so I thought, what the heck, I might as well work while I'm here. I've never heard of diving sea urchins before, so I went down to talk to the guy, and I'm still doing it. That was 1975. Sea urchin diving had just started up here, and it was like a big boom, and everyone was excited about it. And so we moved up here. It's been a really good fishery. It's it's taken care of our family and um, it's a really good business and all of our kids are involved in it. My older brother, he's been diving I think since he was 16 or 17. My younger brother is also an urchin diver. He got his permit in the lottery I believe in 2010 and um, that same year my nephew and my husband all got their permits that year. For them to all get chose the same time. I mean, it was just, it was just so awesome. We were real happy about that. I was burned out on a bunch of the other stuff that was going on in my life, and I went on a couple trips to Bolinas with a friend, and it was that time of year when Weather was lovely and the fish were big and, you know, the first fish I had on the end of a line was an 18 pound fish and it was the most exciting thing I'd done in a long time. I grew up catching trout with my dad, but not any kind of big fish. So it was a lot more exciting than anything else I was doing and then a whole bunch of other stuff fell apart and I got talked into buying a boat and the rest just kind of happened. I 
I basically just always had a love for the ocean. Grew up surfing and fishing in lakes and rivers. Went to school to be an elementary school teacher and basically found out that I wasn't gonna be able to get a job in the area that I grew up and bought my first boat and started dabbling in uh, hook and line uh, link cod fishing, did a little bit of halibut fishing, uh, then eventually started doing black cod, and then it all kind of caught on. I figured, you know, why not be able to do something that I can make a living at, what I love to do. Scott and I have known each other a long time. We grew up playing baseball together. We sport fished, you know, in our own boats, you know, 12, 13, 14 foot aluminum boats. We both have families, so we're having to provide. Um, and I guess you would say that we're pretty hungry. My first memory is probably 12 or 13, and my dad was out fishing squid. And I, it was summertime, so I was off, and I went for a ride. I went anchored up, waiting for dark, and I had a fishing pole. I caught, a, I think, a 23-pound halibut. And he asked me, well, do you want to keep it or do you want to sell it? How much is it worth? Uh, worth $50. So of course I sold it. I was 13, never had so much money. And then right after uh, high school, I fished in the summertime, went to college, decided fishing's better than college. I was sick of school, and then I've just been sticking with it ever since. You learn the boat, you learn how that hopefully the right way to operate the equipment and what to do when something goes wrong, how to fix it. My dad's my dad's around. I, he calls me all the time, he's nervous. <laughs> Wondering how things are going. This is his first year not on the boat. Last year I took it a few days for the squid when he didn't want to go. Then this year he said, all right, go ahead and take it full time. The top six seafoods that we eat in this country are number one is shrimp, number two is canned tuna, number three is salmon, um, number four is Alaska pollock, number five tilapia, number six Pangasius catfish. And each of those really has no connection to a local estuary, to a, no a local fishery. Um, it's um, a commodity, really. A lot of the seafood is also not raised or caught here in the United States. For example, over 50% of the shrimp is coming from Asian countries, from farms. Salmon is coming from Norway, Chile, and British Columbia. Tuna is coming from the high seas, fished by dozens of nations. Whitefish could be anything like tilapia, farm raised in China, to tilapia farm raised here in the United States. So it's really important for consumers to ask, well, what seafood is this that I'm eating? What is this whitefish? And, and where is it from? How is it caught? Is it farm raised? If we were starting a black cod trip today, we usually make five day trips. We take about a ton of bait and uh, buy our groceries, fill up the fuel tanks and we'll look at the weather and see whether the weather's going to be better in north or south. And what we usually do is we aim for the, uh, the canyons, the undersea canyons we have along the coast here, like Delgado Canyon, Matoll Canyon, Mendocino Canyon, uh, an area where the bottom isn't just soft, stinky, muddy bottom. If, you, if you've got shady or harder bottom, uh, usually the black cod will hang out in those kinds of places more. There's all these little areas and places and sets we've made over the years that we, we go back to. After all the years we've been doing it, we, we kind of know where to go anymore. This is 100 pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 400 pounds. And we've caught a lot of fish there before. It's the kind of bottom that black cod like. So that's where we go. And you can see the other, the colored lines in the canyon. We built this boat in 1980, and it's a 55-foot steel boat. It's called a Black Hawk, you know, and it was built intentionally to fish black cod year-round, and that's what we did for the first eight years. And then when the black cod fishery got to be restricted, and then we started crab fishing, and then we started long-lining rockfish, and then we salmon fished, and did all the other things that, uh, you know, we had to do in order to keep keep going. Boat's well, been from. Uh, uh, the Fairweather Grounds in Alaska down to off of Santa Barbara in town in Southern California. Black cod's a deep water fish. We took the black cod fishery basically away from the Japanese and the Koreans. They used to come on the west coast here and in Alaska and longline black cod 
And when the 200 mile limit went in, all the blackout grounds, of course, are inside 200 miles, so the, the American blackout fleet got to take over the fishery. We've got what we call ganyons tied into our line with a hook on the end of the ganyon. We cut squid into small chunks, like an inch or an inch and a half long, and bait all those by hand. Typically on a black cod trip, we bait somewhere over 8,000 8, hooks every day. It's tedious, you know, it's, it's tedious, and you need, you need a really good crew. I always like to get athletes that had uh, good hand-eye coordination because, you know, baiting 8,000 hooks is not something you can do slowly if you're going to get through a day. When I first started fishing, the hardest thing for me was uh, just patience and just kind of try and slowly learn techniques. I was uh, laid off working in, in a farm in Idaho, and my brother called me and told me he had a job on a good boat, and uh, I jumped all over it. I mean, it was an opportunity to come make some quick cash and to actually learn something that I, that I thought that I would want to be getting into, you know. I've always fished my whole life, you know, sport, so I figured give commercial a shot and see if I can do it, you know. It's, it's physical, it is mental, and number one, you cannot get seasick. On each end of the set is a 75 pound anchor. And they basically go down, straight down to the bottom, 1,200 to 1,800 feet deep. And on that buoy line, there's a big red buoy, plus there's a flagpole, and that flagpole has a radar reflector, a flag, and a light on it. Any one of those three, three things will show us where that is, and we haven't marked where it went out. The real important thing is to have guys back there that know exactly what to do and never make mistakes. Because if they forget to tie a tub together or they tie it backwards or they allow a hook to get inside the tub, all sorts of things can happen. You can have tubs going out in a pile. You can have people getting hooked and pulled overboard. You know, and I always tell them, in the, you know, when they first start, if something happens back there that you don't feel good about the way things are going, just let it go. Let it go out in a tangle because that's better than getting yourself booked and, and hurt. time and told me that uh, the only thing you have to look forward to all day long is, is, is dinner. Some boats, you know, they, they scrounge up some top ramen and what, whatever, but I always like to make a nice big dinner for them at night. We'll have a, a roast or steaks or a big pot of spaghetti or with a big salad. So, you know, at least they've, they've got that to look forward to during the day. Well, that
sea urchins are always on the rocks. Their main food that we're hunting for, the urchins, are the ones that are eating the bull kelp and the palm kelp. And that's what gives them that nice color and the, the right kind of um, firmness and stuff. Urchin is a dive fishery in the state of California. Every urchin is selected, sized, picked by hand. We go down with them and get them. When you dive under the ocean, you your element changes. We're totally out of our environment. You know, now all of a sudden you're not, you just can't breathe. You, you gotta think about breathing. You gotta get used to having water in your eyes, salt water in your eyes, the cold. It's, especially up here in the Northern California, it's always cold. See you down there. We um, have hookah lines. It's about a 500 foot hose that comes back to a surface supplied air. Uh, you probably hear the compressor running in the background. Um, this supplies air to the divers. Uh, no tanks. We don't want to worry about running out of air. We're working hard down there, and you know, uh, tanks don't last very long when you're working hard. Not only that, it tethers us to the boat. I like being tethered to the boat. <laughs> underwater I mean you know it's it's a whole nother world down there I don't have to deal with anyone I don't have to put up with anyone I go down there and it's just me and the fish and the urchins and whatever whatever else is swimming around it's it's just a very pleasing you know it's calming You know, I've probably been free diving since I was about 12, um, you know, and I lived within walking distance to the beach, so it's just kind of been a way of life for a long time for me. Casey Hall, 37 years old. I've been doing this for four years. I am the tender, so I'm kind of bottom of the totem pole. I take care of all the divers and all of their needs. I gotta make sure they have enough hose so that they can run underwater freely without getting hung up. You know, especially with four divers, you know, I'm tending to one person and the other hose gets stuck.
when they have a full bag, uh, they come up to the surface. They surface, I spot them, and uh, they yell at me if I don't see them. And so I usually, you know, turn around real quick, and my job is to get them back to the boat as soon as possible. They don't want to. They don't want to be dangling out there with like shark bait. They're ready to get back and get on to the next bag or whatever their next move is. It's exciting. I mean, it's it's good physical work to be out in the ocean. You see amazing wildlife. It's exciting in the sense that it's a little bit scary. It's a little bit kind of a nutty job, really. You have to deal with situations on the water, emergency situations quite often. Boat breaks down on the water. You have to fix it on the water. You know, rocks are always a threat. Well, we get real close to the rocks. They're, they're right there. <laughs> And this business, um, you know, it's you're out there on the water and the weather changes and, and it can be dangerous. I mean, you know, you're, you're breathing, you're down there in the water all day long. So, you know, if something goes wrong, it could end your life. Obviously, you know, the first thing you think of is sharks. That's always a threat, but I would say it's more the day-to-day -day threat that they really face. If something happens to the compressor, then, you know, they're down there diving off these hoses and they get bad air. Yesterday, um, my youngest son almost drowned because the tender pulled the hose and he pulled the wrong hose and he pulled him into his bag and he couldn't get loose and he couldn't get his weight belt off, but luckily he got out of it. But things like that do happen. And so, Experience teaches you how to get out of those situations. Because they are going to happen. Those things do happen. If you're on the surface, you're watching the other guy's bubbles, making sure there's bubbles. <laughs> you know, if there's no bubbles, there's a problem. You know, we all just try and come out here and look out for one another and be as safe as we possibly can. Because, you know, we're family, man. And <laughs> It's all of our butts on the line out here, you know? So just try and look out for one another and do anything we can to make sure everybody comes home. <laughs> it doesn't worry me as much as it probably would somebody who's just coming into the business, just because I've been, I grew up in the business, around the business, and I mean, but I do realize that there's dangers and I do, I do worry about them. I used to be really concerned about it, and I thought, well, you know, I can either be concerned about their lives or I can pray about it, and I, I choose to pray about it. And the confident part, other than I know that, you know, I ask God to watch out for us, and he does, is Tom has, as part of his um, makeup, is in that water, and it's like, you know, a kid knowing how to ride a bicycle. Once they learn, they know it. Beginning of the season, we're going as often as possible. Scott and I are getting up at Boulder Creek at 4, 4.15 in the morning. We head down here, we warm up the boat, make sure that we have everything together. Some of our gear that we have to travel to, it takes us two hours, maybe two and a half hours to get to. We head out at around 5.30. Um, we have to use lights because it's dark. Fisherman waking up exhausted. <laughs> yeah, the area 
that we're going down to now has been actually fishing pretty well for us. A lot of people don't fish out of Santa Cruz. I think yeah. mostly because they don't make their quick fortune. We have 175 traps we can fish and 250 on the other boat. They're essentially gonna be out in the water uh, all the way until you're done fishing. You know, it's not like you bring them in you know, after the day's done. For us being a small boat, you hope that we're gonna be able to catch enough crab to where it makes it worth our while you know, going out through the season. We try and fish as hard as we can. We, when the seasons are going good, we, we fish as many days as possible. I'm kind of learning, you know, just because crabbing's good this year doesn't mean it's gonna be ne good next year. And that's the one thing that I need to really uh, make sure is that we try and save enough money um, so that we can get through those slow years, because I know we'll have them. Everyone does. The beauty of fishing is when you go out there, you could have a really good day and you can make a lot of money, but you can also go out there and you can go negative. And so far, we've been really successful in what we've done. Um, I'm really fortunate. Besides being your own boss, I mean, you, you get to make your own hours and if you don't feel like going fishing on that day, you don't have to, even though we were, end up working pretty hard. But you know, there are things that I've considered. I don't have a 401k as of yet. I have to save my own money. I don't have insurance and whatnot for myself personally as of yet. So there's definitely different things that I have to consider since I'm not working for an employer. I don't think there's really any better place to be out on the ocean. It's such a, a live place. You get to see so many different other marine mammals and it's just a whole different experience than being on land. You know, it's not for everyone and it's not, you know, maybe as glamorous as I make it out to seem because there's days out there that I'm really glad when I actually come back home. You know, there's uh, really bad weather conditions and stuff like that that we deal with. Um, but it's just, it's, an, it's a really neat place to be. You know, there's something different about such a giant body of water that just seems endless when you're out there. It, it can be dangerous, you know, you're dealing with the moving ocean and swell and uh, hydraulics, you know, which are, are very strong on a boat. Um, I mean, we're dealing with uh, crab traps that are, you know, between 70, 90 pounds. Uh, that physically, you have to move these things around. It's a labor of love, and if you didn't like the ocean, this would be the worst place that anyone would ever want to be because it's, it's not the most friendly environment. Everyone wants to come home from the ocean. I mean, they could say she's a, she could be a wicked place. She has no mercy. The weather these days with the NOAA and whatnot and the predictions, it's fantastic compared to what fishermen had to deal with back in the days. They didn't have any of this equipment, but sometimes that gives you a little bit of a false sense of security when, the, when they say that maybe the wind's only gonna be five knots and you will go out there and all of a sudden it's 20 knots or 25 knots. I wanna be able to come home to my family and I want my deckhands to be able to come home to their families. I don't need a spot reserved for me on a memorial plaque, you know? Money's not worth that. So this time of year, the Sacramento fish are beginning to come back towards the Sacramento River, and so that means that they all pass through the San Francisco Bay, and hopefully they stop off at Bolinas for, you know, last little McDonald's before they go up the river. It's a lot more fun to fish Bolinas. It's close by, which is really nice. You can run for an hour and be at the fishing grounds. 
All of the ocean caught fish in California and Oregon are caught with hook and line. So that means we catch them one at a time on barbless hooks. The gear that we use is very specific, but there's always going to be you know, a small Chinook that gets hooked or a coho that gets hooked or a rockfish. And when the barbs are removed, you can release those fish with much lower mortality. You have these, uh, they're called girdies, and they've got, you know, stainless steel wire on them. Right. And then it's a pretty elaborate setup. I mean, you can run in California, you're allowed to run six individual wires yeah. off the boat. Right. So people will have these things called bow poles, uh, where they're the first lines that come through. And then you have a set that they're called your heavies that you have like 50 pound cannonballs on for leads. And then there's a set of float bags that that float behind them so everything's kind of staggered out in the water column and it's kind of cool when you go through a school of fish you've got these springs on the end and you see when a fish bites on your spring starts stretching yeah. and then you keep trolling because you want to tire them out a little bit and then once you kind of think you have a bunch you just start individually hauling those lines it's pretty cool run the gear continuously all throughout the day because if it's rough you don't see the springs you don't see the fish bite you just have to keep running the gear so you keep the the hooks clean that are there small fish you don't notice on the line but that's taking up a hook that you might catch a, a legal fish on so your day is just spent running the gear and cleaning fish and icing them and taking care of them We catch everything one at a time on hook and line. Every single fish you eat has been handled by a person who is getting it out of the ocean for you. The salmon fishing this year, the whole coast from Bodega or Sport Bragg south, there was practically no fish in the area. You'd get a few, you know, 21 day and five one day and one, you know, it wasn't just not sustainable. There just wasn't enough fish to keep you busy or make any money. You know, they have a head and a tail and they go where they want to go and where the feed is and we may not even know why they do it. It's not like there weren't any fish. They just were someplace else. I am um, an observer for fish and wildlife in the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, and I'm working to sample commercial salmon boats. So when they come in, I'm counting the number of fish that come off the boat, I'm interviewing the fishermen, and then I'm also looking for hatchery fish. This is a hatchery fish, and um, it has a tag in its head that was placed when uh, it was real young, still in the hatchery. It has information on it telling you uh, what run it's from, how old it is, and uh, what hatchery and what river. The salmon life cycle, it's still not really well known about, and so this, this is just another way to figure out, you know, where these fish are from. Uh, a lot of the data that's coming back, um, there's Santa Cruz fish up in Oregon right now. A lot of these fish are actually from the Sacramento River, and without the research that, um, you know, I myself and many other people have been partaking in, we wouldn't know that. So it's just another way to figure out what the salmon are doing. I fish with my son. He's been fishing with me now. This is his fourth year full time working with me. And my father was a fisherman, so this is kind of a third generation for us out of San Francisco. So I'm very fortunate because most of us don't have that option. We fished up off the coast of Stinson Beach, and it's a traditional reef there that the salmon usually like to hang out for a short time before they make their trek through the bay and up the rivers. I think the projections were a lot better than it actually turned out to be. We've had really good years and really bad years, so I'm gonna say this was an, an average year. It wasn't anything banner, and it wasn't the worst I've ever had, so it was, it was okay.
we were fishing at Bolinas for two and a half days. Um, fishing was not red hot for us. We did not do particularly well. Sometimes you get them and sometimes you don't. But it's satisfying because it's, there's a huge sense of independence, which is pretty great. It, it can also be frustrating because you're the only one that makes you do anything. And you're the only one that's responsible for everything at the end of the day. So when things go wrong, and they all, you know, something will eventually go wrong. And so you better be able to fix it. <laughs> Squid usually summertime here, usually starts in July. For a, f a few years, there wasn't much money in the fisheries, mid 2000s. So not a lot of new people were getting in. And it was just, you know, the uh, people that had been in it their whole life. There's a group of us younger guys getting into it. Now that the money's a little bit better and you can make a living. We fish with five crew guys. John keeps us in line, the old guy. He, he's been fishing with my father 50 years. Jeffrey, I've fished with him on and off. He was, I think, in high school when he started crabbing with us on the boat. And uh, he's been fishing full time for a couple years. And both our fathers had fished together. So that, that was already there for us, but the more and more we spent time on the ocean and fishing, the closer we got, and it really, you know, it's a friendship you can't replace. We're both young, but he's, he's got a lot more going for him. And, really sharp when it comes to managing fisheries and, and working hard. He's, he's a top, top notch. Frank, I sold two of my older boats. And uh, he's just a great guy, so I brought him. He's a good cook also. And Porter uh, likes good food, so I get, I get pushed that direction. We try to eat a lot from the ocean, so we'll get an abalone and salmon and sea bass and uh, whatever, whatever we can muster up. Sometimes we even eat the squid. <laughs> Emilio, he's kind of nuts, but I don't know, he just he does anything, that guy. He doesn't care. <laughs> he keeps us laughing, that's the main thing. And he go, he'll put his nose down and do any job you ask him. It's great. Squid live up and down the coast. So they, they get them all the way down in Ventura. There's boats fishing, and, they, and they're seeing squid all the way up the coast, all the way up to Eureka and, and beyond. They got like a one-year life cycle. If they're feeding on krill, they get bigger because krill is really easy for them to grab. They really get concentrated when they come in to spawn, and that's when we want to catch them. I have to go find the fish, which is the hard part. You have to be really good at using your equipment on the boat, your sonar, your fish finder. And then uh, it's also looking for birds, looking what they're eating. If they're eating squid, you got an idea where to start your look. Sometimes you just run right over the top of them. It's really easy. Sometimes you just spend a day looking, can't find anything. It can be really boring, but that's part of the job. The squid fishery, there's an eighth of a mile gentleman's agreement. You give room to another boat. So you try to find your little spot where you think they're going to be, drop your anchor, try to hold that spot until night. Then you just, you know, take a nap, cook dinner, or kill time till dark. We'll uh, turn the lights on and try to get them to come up to the boat. And if they come up real thick underneath the boat and stuff, then we'll pull the anchor and Porter will move the boat into position and kind of go a little bit quicker and turn to get all the fish over to one side, the side that we set the net off of, and then we'll let the skiff go to pull the net. Driving the skiff, first thing I do is uh, attach the purse line from the net to the skiff. And so as I go backwards, the net starts going and gets momentum. And once about 30, 40 yards of net are in the water, the skiff turns around and then I start pulling from the back towards the boat, and that's gonna create a circle that ends up being the net that catches the fish. After I hand the rope off to the guy on the side, there's a Canadian-style pull pin. I pull that, which releases the purse line that I was towing off. And then, depending on the area we're in, I can use lights, which is squid are drawn to lights. And I'll sometimes go in the middle of the net and get them to come up. 
And after that, I jump the corks, which is the outside top flow to the net. And then I come around to the other side of the boat and I grab the, uh, the tow line. Pole in the boat is real crucial though, so you gotta pay attention. It actually has a lot to do with how the, the boat operates and the captain will give me a signal, pull harder, you know, slow down, depending on what we're doing. A lot of times when it's real rough weather, I'll actually stay in the boat and keep the boat into the swell. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be able to fish, so it's, it's a crucial piece of equipment. Once we make our, our circle in with the net, I drum the net back. We'll clip in the purse line, and the purse line will uh, close the bottom of the net, bring the bottom of the net to the side of the boat. And once we pull the purse line in, then that's when we got them. And we can uh, purse the net up and then roll the fish into what they call the sack. And once the fish is in the sack, we can uh, put that big squid pump in there. it over to our deep water, which the squid slide across and the water drains out and then they go straight into the hatch. And my job goes to uh, sorting out any jellyfish and stuff and try to keep the squid pretty clean of what just squid coming in the boat. It's real clean because you're actually targeting the one school of fish. Uh, every once in a while, you'll get some jack smelt, a little bit of uh, herring or anchovy mixed in. But overall, it's a very clean fishery. It got rated, you know, the lowest tier of bycatch. We don't have to have an observers or any, anybody like that. Usually about two miles away, we can see that radar reflector on that flagpole. We get to the flagpole and the buoy and we pull that up and it's usually 15 or 20 minutes just to get to the gear from there because we've usually got, uh, you know, 400 fathoms and, and more buoy line. So it, it's 15 to 20 minutes to get to that. Being, being alone out in the ocean is no problem for me, and I think that's kind of another thing it takes to be able to handle fishing, is to be able to be out there by yourself, you know, with just you and your crew and your boat somewhere where, you know, there's no one around to either help or hinder what you're doing. With myself, I was always, from a little kid, fascinated with fishing. I'm always amazed at what we can pull out of the ocean sometimes. Everybody with a, a black cod permit has what they call a tier limit. You know, there's three tiers. And so when the season's open, you can just go out and get your limit. Like this year, we had a total of 77,000 pounds. And then after, uh, after we catch our limit, the uh, permitted boats 15% of that quota goes into a trip limit fishery, and that's what we're doing here. We can catch 1,110 pounds today. Once the fish start coming aboard, what you want to do is, you know, if you think you're going to be over that limit, you start letting the smaller fish go. 
So that's that's one one way to uh, make sure you're not keeping a whole bunch of little ones and just go fish where the big ones live. You know, and with a few years experience, you kind of learn, you know, where to go to do that. Just another tough guy here. We don't really avoid catching other species. Every every set we ever pull has either just a few or sometimes a lot of other kinds of fish. Lynn cod, we catch one once in a while. And skates, we, you know, we let them go and they're usually live. You know, it's, it doesn't bother me if we catch something and turn it back live. In the Fort Bragg area, we can't get inside of 150 fathoms legally anymore. And we used to do, we used to fish in there a lot. We can't access for that for black cod because they have a problem with a couple of rockfish species. They, they've assumed that the yellow eye and the canary rockfish are practically extinct, so they, 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 everywhere that they live is off limits anymore. Fishing is so restricted, you know, especially even in California, um, that there is a lot less seafood that is coming, you know, off of these docks. There are a lot less fishermen these days that um, necessarily can afford to actually fish because of the closures. And you're seeing kind of people like myself and Scott and a lot of the other younger fishermen that have kind of adapted to that. You know, obviously for us, sustainability is, is the most important thing. We want to be able to go out there and catch fish and feel like we're not harming the resource and things like that. But a lot of times, you know, a lot of these rules are made uh, by people that, you know, are mean well and, you know, they're highly educated and things like that, but they have no actual practical experience of what these rules will um, cause to happen. And that's the hardest part to deal with, are, are all the regulations. There is a buffer zone from 100 fathoms to 150 fathoms from Mexico to Canada, where trawl vessels cannot fish. That was our prime fishing grounds, really, was, was that 100 to 150 fathoms, is where the majority of the vessels used to fish. And it's been, it's been closed now for, I don't know, 13 years. And there's a lot of species that they could access that are healthy stocks that they can't because they can't go in there because at one time there was a stock that swam in there that was classified overfished. And that hurts. You know, we went to this IQ program. When it first came implemented, we lost our whole crew because the boats really weren't sure what they were gonna do. We didn't know who was gonna fish. So we went three months without any ground fish. We lost everybody because you can't expect people to sit idle for three months and not work. They found the other jobs. A lot of times there's a catch-22 with respect to the short-term impact on a fishing community versus the long-term sustainability of the resource. You, know, you have NGOs asking you not to eat something at all. You have scientists saying there are warnings out there. You've got the seafood industry, the fishers might be saying, oh, I'm seeing something totally different. Over 10 years ago, the rockfish fishery off the coast of California was declared a disaster area. The populations weren't there, there was a lack of data, people were angry. And Seafood Watch red-listed the fishery because we were concerned about the population of the rockfish. And we wanted more information to be available and we wanted to know it was being managed responsibly before we moved it out of that category. So what we saw happen is we saw the fishing community come together with some pretty progressive NGOs who are willing to come to the table and work with fisheries managers and come up with a joint solution. Let's get better data, let's fish this fishery in a way that's not going to have long-term impacts. And it happened. We saw the fishermen work with the scientists, the resource managers, and the NGOs to collect the data. If the fishermen are seeing something different out there, work with resource managers, work with the scientific community, bring all that information out into the public domain, and let's better manage the resource together. And I think that's a perfect example of how community-based fisheries management can truly, truly work. If they listen to the fishermen a little bit more, yeah, th good things could happen. The fisherman's out there every day. He knows it's all about targeting your healthy stocks and leaving the other stocks alone. I mean, with the sonars and Fathometers and nets and gear, they have the technology to go and stay away from stocks that uh, they don't want to catch.
A lot of fishermen will walk up and down the docks and bitch and moan about what councils are doing or what the regulators are doing, but they'll never go to a meeting and say anything. I think fishermen are, you know, have responsibility to respond to whatever government's doing and saying, and they also have responsibility when they're on the ocean to try not to do things that are going to harm a resource. You can go out trawling or longlining and set your gear in a place where you know you're not going to keep many of the fish that come up on the hooks or the net, but you're going to keep a few and you're going to discard the rest and you're going to kill a lot of those fish that you don't keep. Some people, though, to catch a thousand dollars worth of fish, they'll, they'll discard ten thousand dollars worth of fish because they want to get that thousand dollars worth of fish the easiest way possible. You know, where you could go maybe spend an extra day getting that thousand pounds with no discard. You know, the crab fishery is like, like trying to wipe out cockroaches. You know, you can't, you can't get rid of them. No matter how overcapitalized the fleet gets, it seems like the crab keep coming back and coming back and coming back. The competition's pretty fierce, but still a, a young guy that works hard can make it in a crab fishery. Getting into commercial fishing is, can, is extremely expensive. You have slip fees and bait and fuel and paying for employees and whatnot. And that's kind of why I worked really hard to try and save money and get into the commercial crab fishery. So far, they've regulated that fishery to where it seems like it's a very consistent fishery to where we're, we're only allowed to keep male crab that are, you know, six and a quarter inches. Um, you're not allowed to keep female crabs. The reproduction cycles and whatnot, even though we harvest quite a bit of them, seem like as long as the ocean conditions are good, those crab constantly replenish themselves. And you got to check this leg, make sure they're not soft. You don't want to be selling so many crab with no meat. You have yeah, to have check. those legal certified gauges. Yeah. You've got to check them all. If you are over that 1%, it's at their discretion of if they're going to give you a ticket or whatnot. Say you're like 3 or 4%, they'll confiscate your whole load. So. They make it pretty clear, make sure you measure them. I know for myself and a lot of people that I fish with, you, you, you have to care about the environment. You don't want to fish that animal out of the water because that's something you want to replenish so that it's gonna be there for years to come. And also for myself, I'd like to see my children be able to participate in the same things that I was able to. Sometimes people think like, you know, you're not a preservationist or an ecologist. You have to be. If you're not that person, then the ocean, the fisheries aren't there for you in the future. You know, we're not in this for one day, one year. You know you got a bag hanging, don't you, Casey? Or are you just gonna drag that one home? Huh? <laughs> yeah. When I started, it was a brand new fishery. Um, it only been going on for a very short time and they were actually still picking them in trash cans and loading them up on the boat in the hands. They weren't even wenches and stuff. And so we kind of invented the fishery as we went along. And um, in the 80s, the fishery really exploded. We went from 200 divers to 1,000 divers in one year, um, which really put a pressure on the fishery. There were probably 50 boats working in this area right here at the time. But it's a virgin fishery up here that had never been harvested before, and the resource was unbelievable. It, there was a lot of pressure, but there was a lot of urchins. It went on for a lot of years. It was really good for a lot of years. Luckily, in our fishery, what we did, we saw a problem coming with all those guys and all that harvesting going on. And we realized in order to save our fishery, what we had to do is put some regulations in. So we went to the Department of Fish and Game, and um, we asked them for some regulations. We can only pick it down to three and a half inches is the minimum shell size. And really, it only takes three and a half months, four months sometimes, for the urchins to size up. It leaves more to grow. It leaves next season's urchins. There was a time in this state, in all fisheries, where it was rape and plunder. That's just the what it was, you know? But fishermen, the ones that are in it now, the ones that are really dedicated to this fishery, th it's a different attitude now. When I started 40 years ago, we thought this resource would never end. It was just like, you, you couldn't pick them all. But we have seen that you can pick them all. And we've taken steps to curb that. So the resource itself is just in great, great shape.
but it's a managed resource and it needs to be watched all the time. Being a working salmon fisherman, you never necessarily know if you're going to have a season and you don't know what the quotas are gonna be. The salmon season was about two thirds as good as last year. We unloaded about two thirds as much fish as we did last year. But it is the third year of a drought and the salmon is absolutely affected by how much water comes down the river. How much water is taken out of the river is more what affects salmon. Before the white guys got here and screwed up the hydraulics in California, we had, you know, multi-million fish runs in the Sacramento and the San Joaquin and the Klamath Rivers and every coastal stream. Now we've lost 25,000 miles of spawning gravel behind the big dams in California. We've diverted probably 90% of the water that used to go down the river and through the delta and through the bay. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're in a tough spot as far as the salmon. You know, salmon, they have a one to eight year lifespan in the ocean. They're born in the rivers and then they have to come out of the tributaries down the rivers and then go battle out in the ocean, which is incredibly tough, and then battle their entire way back. But then there's also so many different demands that people put on them in terms of uh, catching them, in terms of uh, sedimentation runoff uh, from erosion, forestry. It's not one thing that can be blamed in terms of salmon population declining, but uh, it's a whole bunch of different things. And uh, so my hope is that with the right management and that kind of a thing, uh, in the future that the salmon population is going to make a really steady comeback. The rest of the fish we catch, the crab, the black cod, the tuna, rock cod, everything else that uh, doesn't depend on those freshwater flows as much, um, is in great shape because everything is precautionarily managed so that, you know, this is totally sustainable. Sustainable fisheries management means that you don't catch more fish than can be replaced by the biomass every year. Uh, I think, you know, the, the key is that we just try and do as little harm as we can or even do no harm to the resource and still, you know, produce this real high quality uh, food for people. Uh, I think, you know, the idea of a single diesel engine, you know, on the ocean and then producing lots and lots of uh, fresh seafood, you know, tons and tons of it sometimes. It's a lot better than, say, factory farming or battery chickens or these other things that really do cause a lot of environmental damage. I think it's important to all fishermen that we maintain a uh, sustainable resource in the salmon fishing and crab and everything else. We've gone and made legislation to help the resource be stable and sustainable. We've taxed ourselves six cents a pound on salmon and, and, and put this money into restoration, into regraveling, into to helping hatcheries. And so fishermen have put their money where their mouth is and where their business is, trying to do something that will help them keep fishing and maintain the stability of the, whatever fishery they're involved in. That's my livelihood. I would like to see it sustainable and be able to do it until I die. I don't want to have to go pump gas at 90. <laughs> so. Jacques Cousteau and Sylvia Earle and the great oceanographers of, of our last century have had slightly different messages, but they've all agreed that if we're gonna save this planet, we need to save the ocean. And if we're gonna save the ocean, we need to really cultivate our connection to it. Where a lot of groups, like environmental groups or, or government agency, what have you, working on this problem, sometimes miss a trick is there's this common belief that we need to fabricate this connection. We need to build a connection. We need to find a way to take person X from wherever and, and connect him or her with the ocean. We can talk about connecting people to the ocean. We can talk about bringing them there. 
or we can talk about the connection that we already have, the most visceral, strongest connection between humanity and the ocean, which is the fork, right? The chopsticks. It is, we eat it. That's what we do with fish. We eat them. 1.5 billion people on this planet depend on fish as their only source of protein. And then everybody else, people like myself, patrons at this restaurant, we have the choice and often do choose to indulge in that as a source of protein. This is a huge relationship. Yes, we've been using it in a pretty careless way, but I really think that it's also the answer. I think it's the opportunity. How can you use that connection to do something positive for the ocean? And I think that's the beauty of seafood sustainability. There really is no more intimate connection you can have with your environment and teed from it. If you're eating from it, you wanna know what's happening with it, what's in the water, what's being done to the water. Um, are fisheries being regulated in a sustainable way? Are you eating from an ecosystem that is in balance or are you digging yourself into a deficit? Um, these are all questions that I think arise when you know where you're eating from. The seafood consumed in the United States, over 90% is actually imported. So most of that seafood is actually coming from developing nations that don't have a strong uh, management of the resources as we do here in the U.S. And I think that's a surprise to consumers, that the vast majority of their seafood is actually coming in from overseas. And you would think that that's because we have some sort of major deficit of fish in this country. But in fact, we actually export about a third of what we catch, something like three billion pounds annually. In this global market, uh, China can process fish much cheaper than we can here in the U.S. So sometimes we even see fish caught off the coast of the U.S. or Canada, frozen, shipped over to China, thawed, processed, frozen, shipped back, and then distributed around the U.S. So that piece of fish you're eating could have 10,000 miles on it and had been caught months ago. That's done with Alaska salmon as well. Um, it's done with Alaska pollock, which is actually sent quite often to Germany or Holland and turned into fake crab and then sent back to us. So it's, um, it's a very strange mixed up kind of world. The American public that enjoys seafood never really been willing to pay a whole lot for it, unfortunately. Um, so that's why often our best markets are overseas. And, Japan and now China's a big player in the seafood market. A lot of it is because to a very large degree, and it was actually a California fisherman that said this to me, Americans just are not hip to fish. Um, we eat in this country about 14 or 15 pounds of seafood per person per year, whereas in Asia, average per capita fish consumption, depending on the country, is in the 30 to 40 pound range, so almost twice as much seafood per person per year. When you have that kind of seafood consumption, you're gonna have a lot more connoisseurs and people who are ready to pay for good seafood. And so in fact, um, one advantage that California fishermen do have is access to Asian markets and people who are ready to pay top dollar. Um, it's one of the reasons there's been the explosion in black cod fishing um, because that fish, which isn't really liked over here, is greatly prized in Asia um, and a lot of it, most of it, is get, getting exported. Seems kind of screwy, but um... On the other hand, you know, fishermen have to survive. We have to get the best markets we can for our products and make as much money as we can. It's really hard to go fishing and sort of peddle your fish. You know, you can't, can't be two places at once. And any day I miss on the ocean when the weather's good, conditions are good, I, mean, I tend to lose, I can lose huge amounts of money. Seafood isn't software. It's, it's not a manufactured product. It's a direct result of natural systems. I suppose there is some logic in trading things back and forth, but when the disconnect becomes so great that we can't even really trace what should be a primary food group um, to our own coasts, I think it leads us to be fairly disrespectful of our coasts. It's, it's quite a, an honor to be able to work with your children and your grandchildren. And I think um, the way our society is now, that doesn't happen as much as it used to, and it's a shame. People are missing a lot. It's nice um, to be able to move home and be able to live here. Not a lot of people can live here and be successful and have a career. I have um, four other grandsons, 
and I have visions of all of them being either divers or involved in the business with us. I would just assume they're divers because that's what keeps this business going, but um, that's my plan, to try to figure out ways to them get permits when they get old enough. They're not old enough yet, so. We catch it ourselves, we process it ourselves, we watch all the stuff that has to be done to it. Uh, we oversee it all the way to the consumer. For us, we're guaranteed the product's good. And it's, it's an accomplishment for us. I mean, my goal on a given day is to come home and be able to spend a little bit of time with my son before he goes to bed. And he's in bed at, you know, 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And I always, I'm a little bit bummed out when I don't get to make those days. You know, summer vacations and stuff like that that I get, I just gotta work really hard uh, during the year and try and make ends meet and save a little bit of money and then, you know, then get to enjoy life a little bit. Yeah. It's not a bad gig. My fish got offloaded at the San Francisco Community Fishing Association. We offload our fish here to the buyers and then from there, most of the salmon, especially this time of year because there aren't a lot of salmon, um, will stay local. So if you're eating wild, fresh king salmon, then it is probably caught pretty close by. I don't know yet if it's worthwhile. We'll see it. <laughs> Give it a couple more years. I might decide that it's not a good business plan for me. Right now I got a good group of guys, a couple of my friends on the boat. We get along good and we're just out fishing, having a good time. It's hard to, hard to beat that. You're out there on the ocean, there's no traffic, there's no other people. Just a couple friends and making a living doing it. It's pretty awesome. It's rewarding to be able to make it off of what is sustainable and what's out there and it's not knowing what you're gonna see or catch is, it keeps it interesting. It's not a, it's not a desk job, you know? When you go in and work, you don't know what you're gonna see, you know? Some days we got whales around, we got sea lions, we got, you know, all kinds of stuff, porpoise, and it's different. Well, when we either uh, fill the boat up or catch all we all that's there, come into the nearest port, which happens to be Bodega Bay. We brought our own pump up here, so we're able to unload here. Uh, pumps them in uh, bonners, plastic bonners, cover that with ice, and they take them down to, I think Watsonville, our buyer, is located. And they pack them up for either 10 kilogram packs for overseas. If they're real nice, they'll put them in smaller packs for domestic markets. Most of the squid goes to China and the, the domestic's not that big of a market. It's just not a big staple in the American diet.
people ask me almost daily anymore, when are you gonna quit, when are you gonna retire? I'm 73 now, reasonably healthy, I still enjoy doing it. We we're making a pretty good income, so I'm just gonna keep doing it until something happens and I need to stop. For me, at this age, it's pretty much day to day. When I was in my early 20s, I always figured I could outwork just about anybody, and that's, that's a lot of what it took to, to, to succeed in fishing in those days. Nowadays, you gotta work hard if you're a young guy and be smart, figure all the angles, and get permits when you can, lease permits when you can, you know, be able to go from fishery to fishery, and you know, and, and you've gotta be tenacious, you know. You've gotta make, make your mind up. You're gonna do it, and you're gonna make it, and nothing's gonna stop you, and no matter what happens, you're gonna figure out a way to do it. So according to NPR, 80% of Americans want to buy sustainable seafood, but it's really challenging. Um, so there's a few tips that you can keep in mind that make it a little bit easier. One, buy small. Eat things that are low on the food chain and tend to be small, like shellfish, sardines, anchovies, squid. These populations are much more able to rebound from, from human consumption. They're really low in contaminants, uh, so they're much healthier for you as well as the oceans. If you were to make the base of your food pyramid, filter feeders like oysters and clams and mussels, the farmed version of those, domestic versions of those, um, that really would propagate, I think, the idea of clean water, um, of taking care of our estuaries. Two, eat things that are seasonal. People are starting to understand that produce is seasonal and that you can't really get fresh local tomatoes in the wintertime, uh, but people are still coming around to the fact that seafood is, is, is just as seasonal. And three, Support local fishermen. If you see something and you know it's, it's caught here in America, probably a good choice. The Seafood Watch program puts seafood recommendations into the hands of consumers in a variety of ways. So we have our popular pocket guide and it actually categorizes seafood into three categories. Green best choice, yellow good alternatives, and basically a red list of things to avoid. We don't expect you to memorize every item on the Seafood Watch Pocket Guide. We do expect consumers to go in and ask questions because just asking questions about where it's from, how it's caught, what is it, is sending a very clear signal to the seafood supply chain. They have a responsibility to have that information available. I think it's about everybody finding within the, the realm that's accessible to them how to live as a better person, how to make micro change, and then adding up all those micro changes into one big macro solution.